in 1850. Acting upon this, President Roberts then, in December 1851, urged the legislature to pass an act in Liberia that would establish the, the Liberia College. You can try the mic now. Jella, just just come and use this this other mic and you know. The cornerstone was laid by the trustees of the nation for education in Liberia in 1858. They also financed that process. Liberia College in 1862 looked like that. Now, I'll give you a slight backstory. After the cornerstone was laid, there was, quite, there was quite a bit of confusion as to where the, the, the college would be located. There was some arguments from, from legislators who wanted the college to be located in a different part of Liberia called Clay Ashland. However, Kip Monserrado, which is where we are today, Monserrado County in Monrovia, won um, at the end of the day and the, the cornerstone was laid. In 1893, this is what Liberia College looked like. After the cornerstones were laid in, um, in 1858 and the university began its operations in 1861, there, were, there was a problem with getting students because only one person showed up at the, in February 1862 to enter the university, the college then. He had to be held back and for the next year as there was a need to have more persons in the college. The first faculty of Liberia College were three very important gentlemen. Dr. Joseph Jenkins Roberts, who had was in the dying finishing time of his presidency became the professor of jurisprudence and international law 
Reverend Alexander Cromwell was teaching intellectual and moral philosophy of the, of the English language and literature. Professor Edward W. Blyding was teaching Greek and Latin language and mathematics. As you can see, Liberia College in 1893 had a few students. We also note that between the years of 1866 to 1902, there were only 10 graduates of Liberia College. It was not until around 1881 that women were finally allowed to enroll in the preparatory department of Liberia College. It so happened that this was the far-sightedness of Professor Dr. William um, uh, Blyden, Wilmot, sorry, Wilmot Blyden that actually led to that. Now, I will take you very quickly to the, some of the past presidents of Liberia College. We have Dr. Joseph Jenkins Roberts, the first, who was the first president. We had uh, Reverend Dr. James W. Piney, Dr. Edward Wilmot Blyding, and there's something significant about him. He became a Pan-Africanist. He was born in the Danish West Indies. He taught at for at the uh, schools in Sierra Leone, and he is currently buried there. He was very far-sighted and to a large extent considered the importance of women in education. We then had Professor Martin Freeman, who was the first black president of a university in the United States. Not the, not the um, Liberia College, we then have Dr. Garrison Wilmer Gibson, who also served as um, the president of Liberia previously, um, before he became president of the University of the um, Liberia College. We had then Orator F. Koch, and then Dr. Garrison Wilmer Gibson again had another tenure as president of Liberia College. Professor Arthur Barclay then succeeded him, but only in an acting capacity. Followed by Reverend Dr. Robert B. Richardson. And then we had Honorable Jenkins, uh, James Jenkins Dawson, who happens to currently have a hospital in Liberia named after him. He was very significant in contributing to moral and legal issues and a lot of issues around ensuring that how, how um, the people of Liberia should respect the rules of, rule of law.
after several presidents of Liberia College, in fact, up until during the period of World War II, the president who led Liberia College was very, he in fact was the longest serving president of the college. He led the country during the college during a very significant and turbulent period. And he led college in 1850. Okay. What, um, T. Ebenezer Ward very significant, like I said, the very, a very significant period. He, he served the Liberia College up until during the period of President William D.S. Tupman, who by this time saw, felt that Liberia was beginning to improve economically, and they at this time could take on some of the responsibility of financing the college. Throughout its history from its inception, Liberia College was financed by the initial group that started it, the trustees for the, of the nation for education in Liberia. They had been very significant in providing the financing throughout that period. So. In 1951, President William D. S. Stubman, being quite far-sighted as he was, and recognizing how important it was for Liberia to have its own educational system, especially for higher education, he then tabled an act in 1951 for the creation of The University of Liberia, therefore, can trace its origin as a university back to that year. And of course, the motto for that university became Lux in Tenet, which is light in darkness. And indeed, this college, which had now become the University of Liberia, was a light in the darkness of not just Liberia, but Africa, black Africa, as this university contributed to the, to the freedom and emancipation of many African nations in this part of the world. Currently, the university has four campuses. Our Flex State Campus is Capitol Hill. We also have Fendo Campus, which is a massive um, property, and where, as Dr. Nelson mentioned, there is, we are hoping to expand <clears throat> to a university city. There is also the AME Dogliotti College of Medicine, which is now called the College of Health Sciences. And then our fourth campus is the David A. Strauss St. J. Campus, which is located in Kickmile County. There is something significant that I'd like to mention on the campus, the Capitol Hill campus of the city of Liberia, there is a bell that is 
dated back to the 1800s. And at that time, this bell was situated in Mambam Point, where the original Iberia College was located. That particular college location, unfortunately, it got burned down. This bell that you see up there was a relic of that time. It used to be the bell that would ring to summon the students to come to class. So it's quite a significant bell, and we're hoping at some point to have this bell restored in a proper historical um, context provided. The current presidents of the University of Liberia, therefore, the first was Dr. J. Max Bond. Then there was Dr. Kermit C. Smith. There was Dr. Rushford Weeks who was the first Liberian born and in, um, who became president of the University of Liberia. We had Dr. Advertus Huff, who served eight, um, 1972 to 1975, followed by Dr. J. Bernard Blum. And very significantly, the first woman Dr. Mary Antoinette Brown Sherman served as president of the University of Liberia in between 1978 and 1984. A very significant period as well, because during that period, Liberia experienced its first coup d'etat. And not only was Dr. Brown Sherman the first female president of, Liberia, of the University of Liberia, she was also the first female president of an African university. Liberia over the period and has had leaders from this very university Many renowned leaders, from presidents to historians to bankers, have walked through the walls of the University of Liberia. I was one of those that actually graduated from the University of Liberia many years ago. So, the, the, as Dr. Nelson very eloquently pointed out, there's a lot of, there are a lot of opportunities to expand this great university. As we move from this point, we have to begin to think on where we want to see education, higher education for this country. The University of Liberia, having been the first in this country that led the way and trained our leaders and trained members of, of other countries, leaders of other countries, we hope to see a major advancement in where we in the next 10 years. We look forward to the importance of the use of STEM, which is the uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, to get us to a point where we begin to develop and become innovative be to work and direct our knowledge to create things and becoming a, a focal point of knowledge in the Republic of Liberia and by extension, Africa. So ladies and gentlemen, distinguished 
guests. I do apologize for the glitch in technology, and I thank you for your indulgence. But please be patient, and please join us as we work towards making this university the light in the darkness, a light that will guide us, a light that will. Make its take its place. I will lead us to a better Liberia. Thank you. Let me ask the kind indulgence to 
than our existing pickle fish. Here's an example of new ones have been forced to leave their home island to see our fish. Our people of African descent first got or began by at least the 16th century to result of the dispersion of millions of African descended people in Asia, Europe, and the Americas. The most documented African diaspora occurred from about the 1500s to the mid 1800s and is called the transatlantic slave trade. It involved the forced embarkation of approximately 12 million captives from Africa to the Americas, North America, South America, Central America, and the Caribbean. The 10 million that survived the deceased ridden in harrowing slave ships from Egypt to Greece crucifying sugar, cotton, and coffee under one of the most dehumanizing slave regime in the world at the time. Today, the descendants comprise largely of large segments of the national populations in the United States and Brazil, two of the world's leading economies. In addition, the former Kafal transatlantic slave trade is being succeeded by vast throngs from the relatively poorer South to areas in the, in the global North, areas that are more, that are richer and more democratically stable. The overall objective of the University of Liberia Center for Diaspora and Migration Studies is to provide an analytical approach to understanding these migrations, the African diaspora, as well as the unfolding global movements of people. Liberia's ongoing 2022 bicentennial suggests that a republic is a probable microcosm of both of these strands. Many of those who have joined in here today to commemorate the 1822 arrival of free blacks also fled political violence in Liberia. In other words, the quote and unquote return being commemorated comprises descendants from the old Kafal slavery as well as present-day so-called voluntary migrants. Last year, just about the time when the University of Liberia's cabinet was deliberating the establishment of a research center to study the issue of the Liberian diaspora in part as part of its contribution to the bicentennial celebrations, we participated in an international diaspora conference hosted by the African Union and the Association of African Universities. Our guest speaker today was a facilitator at that gathering. His passion for the African diaspora issues in many ways helped spur us on to this particular day we celebrate. We are pleased that Dr. Molifi Keti Asante could join us here today for the launching of the Center for Diaspora and Migration Studies as the newest academic unit of the University of Liberia. <laughs> Molifi Keti Asante is professor and chair Department of Africology at Temple University in Philadelphia, the United States of America. 
He is the president of the Mulefi Asante Institute for Afrocentric Studies. Asante was an honorary professor at Zhejiang University, Hangzhou, China, and is Professor Extraordinarius at the University of South Africa. He is the founding and current editor, Journal of Black Studies, and the first director of UCLA's Center for Afro-American Studies. Asante, often called the most prolific African-American scholar, is the author of 97 books. Among the most recent are Being Human Being, Transforming the Race Discourse, The Perilous Center, or When Will the Center for Africa Hold, Radical Insurgencies, The History of Africa, Third Edition, An Afrocentric Pan Africanist Vision, the African American People, a Global History, Erasing Racism, the Survival of the American Nation, Revolutionary Pedagogy, African American History, a Journey of Liberation, Facing South to Africa, and the Memoir as Our Run Towards Africa. Asante has published more than 500 articles and is considered one of the most quoted living African authors as, one of, as well as as well as one of the most distinguished thinkers in the African world. He has been recognized as one of the most one of the 10 most widely cited African scholars and one of the most influential leaders in education. He received his PhD from the University of California, UCLA, at the age of 26, and was appointed a full professor at the age of 30 at the State University of New York at Buffalo. At Temple University, where he now served, he created the first PhD program in African American studies in 1988. He has directed more than 140 PhD dissertations, making him the top producer of doctorate students among African American scholars. He is the founder of the theory of Afrocentricity, the Chick Anta Diop's conference, and the think tank, the Malifi Kente Asante Institute for Afrocentric Studies in Philadelphia, the United States. Asante was born in Valdosta, Georgia, USA. He is one of 16 children. He is married to Anna Yenega, an African Costa Rican. He has three children, Mario, Eka, and N.K. Jr., and six grandchildren. Asante is a poet, a novelist, a dramatist, and a painter. He works on African language, African history, multiculturalism, and human communication and philosophy, and have been cited and reviewed by journals such as the Africological Perspective, the Quarterly Journal of Speech, the Journal of Black Studies, the Black Scholar, the Journal of Communication, the International Journal of African Renaissance, the Journal of Pan-African Thought, and the Udna reader called him one of the 100 leading thinkers in America. Asante has appeared on numerous television and social media programs in Africa, Asia, North America, and South America, and Europe. He has received many awards and honors for scholarship and political and community activism. He regularly consults with heads of state in Africa 
and has become one of the most popular lecturers on issues of Africa today. He served on the Tabo Mbeki African School of Leadership at the University of South Africa. Dr. Asante's writings are in Russian, Spanish, Kiswahili, Portuguese, French, Hungarian, and Japanese. He was the president of the Civil Rights Organization, the Student Nonviolent Coordination Committee at UCLA's chapter in the, in the 1960s. Traditional titles have been conferred upon him in both the Republic of Ghana and the Republic of Mali. Asante has received honorary doctorates and awards from several institutions, including Pepperdine University, the University of New Haven, Sojourner Douglas College, and many others in Africa and other places. His students have included many African scholars, including our own, Dr. Edward Wakayon and Dr. Saar Abdullah Vandi. He is a series editor of Rolech African Studies, History, Economic Society, and series for Anthem Press for Africana Studies, especially in the areas of ethics, theory, practice, and history. And let me say, and much more. Therefore, Mr. President, distinguished guests, it is my pleasure to present to you Professor Molefi Kete Asante, our guest speaker today. I should uh, come to Liberia just to be introduced. <laughs> His Excellency, please be seated. His Excellency, Dr. George Manoue, President, Republic of Liberia, and visitor to the university, Madam Claire Maria Weir, First Lady, Republic of Liberia, Honorable Dr. Jewel Howard Taylor, Vice President, Republic of Liberia. Madam Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, former President, Republic of Liberia. Ambassador Joseph Bokai, former Vice President, Republic of Liberia. Honorable Dr. Bofa Chamber, Speaker and members of the House of Representatives. Honorable Albert Chia, President Pro Tembra and members of the Liber Liberian Senate, His Honor Francis Corpor, Chief Justice, Associate Justices of the Supreme Court of Liberia and members of the Judiciary, Honorable Matthew Zarza, Chairman of the Board of Trustees, University of Liberia, the Dean and members of the Cabinet, the Chief of staff uh, and gallant men and women of the armed forces of Liberia and other members of the security apparatus. Professor Dr. Julius Julikan Sawola Nelson, Jr., <laughs> President of the University of Liberia and the University of Liberia family and the great orator he is. Excellency, the Doyen and members of the diplomatic and consular corps, including ambassadors who are here from many states, including my own United States, uh, excellencies of all nations, uh, Professor Dr. Forde Sa, Vice Chancellor of the University of Sierra Leone, the special representatives of the United Nations, members of the disabled community, and all vulnerable and minority groups, prelates, clergy, heads, and members of religious institutions, kings, 
elders and traditional leaders. I don't use the word chief. That's just an Afrocentric expression. Heads, heads of tertiary and higher educational institutions, members of the fourth estate, distinguished guests, students, Dr. Agnes Reeves Taylor, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I have come on this February 15th, 2022, to celebrate and meditate with you on your bicentennial festivities and the future of this great country, especially in terms of education. I bring you greetings from the brothers and sisters in Philadelphia, an old African city, the seat of much activity to improve America. Fofi Jabate, the leader of Akana, our Philadelphia Association for Africans, told me to make sure that I gave you his special blessings. Philadelphia is the source of many innovations and initiatives. Many of you trace your history to Philadelphia. Africa has given us many ideas, and one of them is the idea of Afrocentricity, an idea that I actually got from an expression made by Kwame Nkrumah in 1961, where he said to W.E.B. Du Bois, who was one of the greatest African intellectuals of the 20th century, I always say that the greatest intellectual of the 20th century was Sheikh Anta Joe. But the second greatest was W.B. Du Bois. And Kwame Nkrumah said to him, I want you to start and develop an encyclopedia Africana. But I want it to be Afrocentric. I don't want it to be Eurocentric. It was a profound statement. And I took that statement and developed the idea of Afrocentricity, which has become, over the years, one of the most dominant ideas in universities throughout the continent. And I give special credit to the University of South Africa under the leadership of one of the great vice chancellors of that university, Manla Makanya, who asked me to come five, four years ago to the university and talk to every faculty in the university about how to resignify and reorganize and reorient the training of professionals in the South African University. It was a great, one of the great moments in education in Africa. And I just wanted to give honor to that. Afrocentricity as an African concept was born in Buffalo as a full-blown theory. Buffalo is in New York in 1980. But it took root in Philadelphia and has spread around Africa and the world. As you've heard, in Japan and Russia, in the UK and China, and other places, Brazil, Colombia, have latched on to this idea. And I think it is a very simple idea, and I will talk about it in regards to the launching of this great center that you have in mind. But I come first to you in the name of Pata, in the name of Aten, in the name of Ra, and in the name of Amen, the oldest names for God in the history of the world. These are African names of God. I pour libations and give thanks to the names of Gabriel Bacchus Matthew and Antoinette Brown Sherman, the mother of the revolution. And I praise the brilliant men and women 
who have led you this far. You have many men and women who shall live forever. Your ancestors' names ring with the freedom and independence of other nations on this continent. I am the sum of my readings, my experiences, and my influences, and I humbly bring this message to you today. I bow before the various heroes and heroines who have insisted on maintaining democracy, although we know that of all political systems, democracy's fragility is dependent upon vigilance. You represent a powerful example of hope, integration of peoples, and the vision of a new age of Pan-African democracy. I am here to testify to your overwhelming sense of the love of freedom, traditions, and good character. Two of my former students, have, as you've heard, Professor Dr. Edward Lama Wankia, Director of Higher Education, and Professor Saar Abdullah Vandi, a former minister, are among those who have made international history as representatives of this nation. They were introduced to my earliest thinking about Afrocentricity and knowledge. And so they knew the books, the Afrocentric Manifesto. They knew Kemet, Afrocentricity and knowledge. And they knew the Afrocentric idea. It has become the most important way that we can reinterpret the understanding of our narratives of history, wherever we are in the world as African people. Of course, the connection between Liberia and the United States is cultural, political, and social, and ideological. So I'm sure that the idea behind Afrocentricity is here as well. It is a simple idea controversial to those who deem the interrogation of African cultures aberrant. But Afrocentricity is extremely resilient. There is nothing more important for you as lessons than our own historical experiences, ancient and modern. Africa owes no debt to any people. All debts have been paid. Even sometimes they have been paid when they were not even made by us. Afrocentricity is the idea that African people and interests must be seen as subjects, as actors, as doers in all areas of life. We are not merely receivers, spectators, and onlookers to history. We are makers of history. This is what Dr. Reeves Taylor just showed us all narratives of ethics, law, religion, language, architecture, and sciences, values, must take the centrality of the African experience into consideration. What have we thought about this or that? Who are we collectively? I was born in Valdosta, Georgia. In the deep south of the United States, with all of the baggage that such a birth came with in the 1940s, I was given the name Arthur Smith, named after my father. After attending the University of California, Los Angeles, receiving the doctorate degree, I wanted to travel to the continent. After all, it is the land of my origin. One of the six nations I visited was Ghana. And that is where the Asante Haney, Opoku Wari II, declared that my name should be Kofi Kete Asante. He asked me, what day were you born on? And I told him. And he said, well, then, if you were born on Friday, then your name should be Kofi. And then he said, but you're not a Britisher. You're not an English person. Why do you have an English name? This is, what he, this is the interrogation that Opoku Wari II gave to me. And then he said, okay, your name really should be Kete Asante. You love the royal music of the drums, and you love this you know, popular name, so you're Asante. 
And I later added Molefi out of solidarity. It's a Suto name from South Africa. Out of solidarity with the South African struggle for liberation. It means one, it means one who keeps the traditions. And that's not my fault. <laughs> it means one who keeps the traditions. So Molefi, Kete Asante. And the interesting thing here is that this name, uh, Molefi, uh, Kete Asante, uh, I was really nervous about it because I, I said, you know, my father, well, what would my father say? But in 1972, when I went to my father and I told him this, my father said, if I had known an African name, I would have named you an African name. I would have even given myself an African name. I am happy for you. It was one of the most, it was one of the most encouraging things he had ever said to me. Because it was the beginning of my examination of the narratives of Africa. Who are we? What traditions do we honor? Whose ancestors' names do we call? These were the questions. So it is true that I was later made the Chiromhini of Tafo, Nana Okru Asante Piazza, in the state of Achim in Ghana. It is true that the Amaru of Gao, Hasimi Maiga, made me a wannadu in his court. But I later discovered, this is how it science is, I later discovered through DNA that my immediate ancestors originated not in Ghana or in Mali, but actually among the Yoruba in Nigeria <laughs> and, among, and, among, and among the Nubians in Sudan. So I'm like, whoa, this is, what is this? Here's a guy carrying a name around, a South African and a, Ghana, and a Ghanaian name, but actually his traditions are in Nigeria and Sudan. So it's a whole different story. So I always tell people I am a true pet African. I lived in Zimbabwe. I trained the first set of Zimbabwean journalists after the second Chimaranga. And like so many of you, my history is complex. Some of it known, some of it remains unknown. But one truth I know, Africa is the origin of humanity. And my aim is always to examine the experiences of this continent. That is the only way to a true Pan-Africanism. It is the only way to humanity. Today I challenge Liberia to assume its rightful place as the modern assertion of a true integration of this continent in a Pan-African way. You do not define your history. Your history defines you. Our task is to make a new future grounded on African ideas and values. We have often been betrayed by believing that Europe is teacher and we are pupil. On the plane over here, I heard a white American sounding every bit like he was a leader of a plantation. His language, his attitude, his ignorance was palpable. And as we do, we just looked at him and let him demonstrate his Southern American arrogance. Most of us in line in Paris for the flight ignored him. And I said to myself that even going coming to Africa, he carries with him the same notion of white supremacy that I found that I left in the United States of America. What is this? How can you do this? Doesn't he understand humanity? That's why I say we have often been betrayed. Pan-Africanism is not merely a theory. 
and a slogan. It's a practice. The African Renaissance is a concrete practice of Pan-Africanism. What country is best prepared by experience and history to lead such a renaissance for the continent? It's prepared also, I believe, by its ideological and security and economic relations with the United States to do this. I'm giving this challenge to Liberia. You, you must make here the diasporic pivot and claim for Africa all its contributions and achievements. No nation is more qualified than you to become the striker for African unity. To do this, we need radical thinking in the sense that we must question ideas that come to us without paying homage to our own ancestors. Let me say this again. If they don't pay homage to your ancestors, you don't need to pay homage to theirs. If the ideas come to you and they have not come from the interrogation of your own history and culture, question it. Who and what are the traditions of beauty? What is the meaning of the good? What are the most important traits of ethics? A young lady said to me at Acha Motor School in Accra, Ghana, she said, Dr. Asante, if the white people had not come to Ghana, would we be civilized? She was 16 years old. I said, before the white people came, we didn't even have to lock our doors. <laughs> now that we got the white people's knowledge and understanding and religion, we have to lock our doors and put fences and walls up. What is civilization? Who defines these things? My question has always been, who said so and why? Did science come from the Greeks? Who said so? Homer was the first Greek that made sense. And he lived around 800 years before Christ. He wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey but they were written after he came here to Africa. 2,000 years before Homer, there was Imhotep. Now, do your children know Imhotep? He was a black man, an African, the first genius in the world, the first architect, the first physician to study diseases and to provide therapies. Imhotep was the builder of the first pyramid. Science, look, science and knowledge is here for us to study and to interrogate. The pyramids of the Nile River Valley are the largest and earliest readable archives in the world. They're in Africa. They're not in Europe. They're not in America. They're not in Asia. They're in Africa. The largest and earliest readable archives. Science is here, the liberal arts, rituals, ceremonies, the names of the gods, the calendar, chemistry, and astronomy, all in the pyramid. This is 2,500 years before Jesus Christ. This is 31 years, 3,100 years before Muhammad. 2,500 years before Jesus Christ, which is longer than we have lived this side of Jesus Christ. 
2,500 years, Jesus could look back to the continent of Africa and say those, those Africans built some, some old monuments. 2,500 years before Christ. Were we waiting around for the Greeks? Were we waiting around for anybody? No. It's already there. There are 106 pyramids in Egypt, which was black, and the further back you go, the blacker it is. There are 255 pyramids in Sudan. This is a, this is a resource. Why do I want to start with the Greeks? Well, why should education start with the Greeks? Well, why should that be a Greek sitting at the door of every discipline? We, but we have, to, we have to interrogate. You here in this fabled country, through a history of courage and devotion to the idea of a universal African community, have demonstrated more than most nations the acceptance of people from other communities. It is no wonder that the University of Liberia has become the fertile ground for the idea of African diaspora studies. This, this pivot will allow you to advance a thousandfold and bring many other people and nations to honor the work you will do. I am truly pleased to be able to examine the faces of those who have had the courage to return to the study of the children of the motherland. Your children are everywhere. Liberia itself is not a static idea. It is a dynamic idea, one that evolves every year and becomes more and more the country that opens its hands to all Africans. This is your history. This is your destiny. 200 years of Pan-African community through trials and tribulations, yes, right here on the powerful bicep of Africa. You are now launching a truly Afrocentric initiative. What a glorious history and sentinel country you have become. Liberia has had recently more than 20 years of unbroken peace. You have committed yourself to the rule of law. Actually, President Weir, His Excellency, made this pledge to the United Nations and has kept his promise in honor of the press, the collective association, speech, freedom, and the rule of law. When he spoke to the United Nations, he was clear about his commitment to freedom. That is the true Liberian spirit, I believe. Let us also be true to ancient achievements of Africa itself. I saw in Nzalo Ilanga, in the province of Mpumalanga in South Africa, the place of the rising sun, where over 100,000 years ago, our ancestors on this continent stood stones up in honor of their ancestors. Thousands of stone structures. They say it is the first structural creation by humans. President Nelson, I come to tell you that you know what you know, and that is that we must maintain vigilance and encourage democracy, individual and collective rights, and the rule of law. The University of Liberia sits at the front steps of our adventure in African diaspora studies. It is the respect for the rule of law that will enlarge opportunities and freedom and make this proposal for our program in migration and African diaspora studies practical, real, and beneficial for the nation and the world. It must not be based on ethnicity, region, and creed but on the collective sense of what is African. Of course, it is not a closed system, and we can always debate the principles of Africanity. 
Martin Luther King Jr. once said that some laws were unjust and that we must accept e even the punishment that comes with breaking those unjust laws because it shows respect for law. Now, a lot of people question that. But he said you work to change the laws. That is why he and his followers went to jail. It is a noble thing to accept law, it, even though it is a poisonous idea to make bad laws just to oppress people. Here in this enclave of liberty, you are now perched on top of academic possibilities with an eternal future. I'm here to encourage you to model the best tradition and practices of Pan-Africanism in education. Ask the hard questions about the future and about our past. Resolve to connect, not to separate. You can and you must rise above ethnicity, protect the smallest and least protected groups, honor them, and you honor the meaning of Liberia. Why are there tens of millions of Africans, the cities in India? What nations did Chang He of China trade with on the east coast of Africa in the 14th century? What is the model for the so-called secret societies? We know they are not secret societies because we know them. But they, but they are but 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 they are but they are societies of secrets. <laughs> Actually they, they contain the text, the poems, the drama, the healing rituals, the information, and the narratives of our existence. Let me give you some facts. The oldest hominin fossil found in the world is found here on this continent. Sohelanthropus, Sohelanthropus chadensis, 7.2 million years ago. They found, a, they found, imagine this, a fossil with bones turned to stone, found in Chad, and they dated to 7.2 million years, the oldest such fossil of a human-like creature ever found. It was found only in one continent, Africa. That is the truth. Think about that. But there's something else to think about. Homo sapiens. Anatomically modern humans like us arose about 300,000 years ago on one continent, Africa. There are no Homo sapiens rising in America or in Europe or Asia or South America 300,000 years ago. They're rising in Africa, Homo sapiens. So, so of the 7 billion people in the world today, all of those people have African DNA from one African woman. Think about that. When you meditate on that, there are a lot of questions that you have, and I know you have them. I had them too. But all humans have DNA from Africa. This is the most diverse continent in the world. The nearly two billion people on this continent represent more diversity than the rest of the world combined. Here, on this continent. Now here's the thing, the earliest Africans, the earliest humans, who were the earliest Africans, there were no, the, all the people in the world were black until 70,000 years ago. There were no other people. Three-fourths of the time that Homo sapiens have spent on the earth was spent in Africa before migration out of Africa. Think about that. So what do we learn?
We had to learn what was edible and what was not. Otherwise, nobody would exist. Everybody would be dead. Ate poison food. <laughs> you know what I mean? We had to learn that. You, you had to learn shelter. You had to learn how to cross a river. You had to learn relationships between people. You had to know your children, so you had to name them. You wanted to know something about astronomy and the stars that you saw at night, and so you had to give names to the stars and planets. Africans did that. The first people to speak the name of the divine were Africans. There was nobody else. There were no Asians, no Europeans, no Arabs. Africans spoke the name of God before anybody. Think about that. I want you to think deeply. I do that as a normal practice. It's important for us as African people to do that. And if we're going to start a center for migration and diaspora studies, think of the diaspora. Dr. Professor Taylor, when he was introducing me, I was thinking about how we were talking after the African Universities Conference and began to get these ideas that sometimes we don't know all that we need to know about ourselves. And that's why I asked the questions I ask. Africans knew diversity more than anybody else. We knew that people were short and some were tall. We knew that some people were lighter than others, some were darker than others. We knew that some people spoke different languages, but you know what? We never ranked people on the basis of their shortness or their color. It was not Africa. It was not an African idea. Listen to this, because this is central. Africans knew that humans were diverse. But because you had brown eyes and someone else had black eyes, we didn't say you were different or better than that person. We knew that. You were human. Humans come in many different colors and with different hair and eyes. And all. We knew that. We didn't rank it. Listen to this. The ranking of diversity is something that came with the Arabs and the Europeans. Listen to it. If you got blonde hair, you better than the person who has black hair. This wasn't an African idea. We didn't come up with anything like that. We knew everybody was human. This is, this is the deepest part of this. And it may, it may have existed even before the Europeans and the Arabs. It may have come with the ancient religion of Hindu, with the Varners, the caste system, an invasion of the Indo-Europeans into India, and the subduing of the darker Indians, and the creating of a religion based on caste. Africans didn't do that never existed. It may have come with Judaism, with the stories of Shem, Ham, and Japhet, and the children of Ham. That whole interpretation is a religious idea. But it is not African. There have been aberrations in Africa in more recent times, but the earliest values of Africa were founded upon the ethics of Ma'at, the oldest ethic in the world. Let me congratulate you 
for setting the model for African global studies with the Center for Migration and the Diaspora. Tradition come, traditions come from doing something. And what, what, what you do will set the path for others to follow. These should be the key principles. These are the key principles of, of such a center. The first migration was African. Homo sapiens exploring. Homo sapiens rising somewhere in East Africa and then setting out to explore. I wonder what's on the other side of that hill. I wonder what's on the other side of that river. I wonder what's on the other side of that forest. Humans exploring. That's the, that's the beginning of it. Africans exploring. And then, of course, Africans crossing into other continents. That's the, that's the very, the first migration of Homo sapiens. Because Homo sapiens migrated in Africa before Homo sapiens migrated out of Africa. And all Homo sapiens didn't leave Africa. Sometimes people say, well, your Homo sapiens migrated out of Africa like everybody left. No, we're still here. So, so here's, here's, that's the principle. The, you start at the beginning. Chronology is important. The, begin with the beginning. The first migration is a migration of the people of Homo sapiens on the continent of Africa exploring. The first explorers and the first adventurers were those people. That's one. Second one. The first nation in the world was African. Kemet. Kemet, some of you know, is the African name for the country that is today called Egypt. But Egypt is not an African name. Egypt is a Greek name. Egyptos is what the Greeks named the African country Kemet. Remember that. Kemet. Kemet was a nation brought together under the power of a king by the name of Menes. Menes, what he did, which was the first nation, he brought 42 different ethnic groups together, gave them the same language and the same symbols, integrating all their symbols and ideas and values and ethics into one. And we got the nation of Kemet. The, the, this, this is the beginning. So the first nation in the world, there's no nation before this. This is around 3,400 years before Christ. 3,400 years. There is no United States of America then. <laughs> there is no Germany. There's no Russia. There, there's, no, there's no Japan. 3,400 years before Jesus Christ, a black king, brings together 42 ethnic groups and he becomes the Purah, which the Jews call Pharaoh, and we follow that today in English. But the, the actual language says Purah, the great house. This, so this is, this, is, this is an understanding of what the center has to do. The center has to be critical. It, it, it has to say, okay, the first migration, the first nation, the first ancient civilization were African. Kemet, Kush, Meroe, Nubia, Aksum. The, the first notion of the religion of mother and child was actually Isis and Horus in the Greek, but in the African, we say Oset and Heru. The first divine trinity was Osa, Oset, and Heru, often called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. This was Africa. The first resurrection was 
when Osa, or Osiris was stood up along the side of the river Nile and the people said, he is the resurrected one. This is the, these are the beginnings of all this. They didn't just think, don't just start. They start from somewhere. Then another principle of this sentence would be what we study. We study early and classical studies. Because if we study the old, the further back we go, we, we know, we know, for example, that we, we get the Arabs coming to Egypt in 639, this era, under the general El Az. You know why El Az came to Egypt from Arabia? After having conquered Jerusalem? Because the black people invited him to come. And you know why the black people invited him to come? Because they were under the control of the Romans. And they said, come over and help us throw off the Romans. And when El Az brought his army into Africa, they decided that, you know, this, this Nile Valley is a good place to stay. And that's why they stayed. And they multiplied. So when you go to Egypt today, and I've been to Egypt about 17 times, when you go to Egypt today, and you see Egypt, Egypt is not what it was before 639. You see, it's the same as when you go to the United States of America. I live in Philadelphia. But the people who lived in Philadelphia before the Europeans came and before the Africans came were the little P. The little P people were there thousands of years ago. So you, it, so it's not the same. It doesn't look the same. They're not even the same people. The composition of people have changed. And that's what happened to Egypt except fortunately in Egypt, there are still black communities. And I go to these communities. I go to Elephantine and I talk to the people. That's how I get my knowledge, talking to the local people. And the local Africans will tell you what's going on in their countries. That's how you begin to get first. I can't write the history of Africa if I don't talk with people. So I talk with people, I read, and I'm influenced by all of it. But it's important to know something before you go out. So the organization of the center must have classical studies, major migrations, forced dispersions, because Africans have been forced to disperse. This is why we have 100 million Africans in Brazil. 100 million black people in Brazil. Trace there. Ancestors of Africa. This is why Colombia in South America has 30% of its population. It's African. And they didn't go there to pick cotton. We picked cotton in Georgia. In, in Colombia, they, they dug in the copper mines. They, that their enslavement was a, was a mining enslavement. Ours was agriculture. Sugar cane. You see and so forth. So we got to look at these dispersions. Why, why are people there? Why are black people in Peru? Why were black people in Baghdad in 900 AD? The first slave revolt was the revolt of the Zanj rebellion. That's why sometimes people call South Africa a Zanya. It comes from the Zanj Rebellion, 900 AD, when the black people revolted against the Arab enslavement in Baghdad. Go look it up. It's in Google. Did y'all do Google here? It means you can find it. It's easy to find, right? But why, look at this. Why did we lose that knowledge? Who stole it? George James of Guyana wrote a book called Stolen Legacy, declared that the Greek knowledge was found first in Africa. In my book, The History of Africa, I've told our own stories and our own names to re-signify our ancestors and actions. We had kings, not just had men and chiefs. And that's why I say I don't, well, Europeans call our kings chiefs. They call their kings kings. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. How, how are you going to do that? What's, what was the difference? 
Why are you going to do it? And, and I'm going to tell you, that's why, look at this. We, we were kingdoms. We were nations. We, 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 um, we, were not, we were not tribes even. We were ethnic groups and nations. Tribe is a diminutive. Europeans are going to go around. I mean, you got, if, if you were talking about tribes, if you go to Russia, where I visited a year or two ago, just, just before the beginning of COVID, and it was very interesting. They got all kinds of people, but they don't call them tribes. They're ethnic groups. The French are an ethnic group or a nation. The only tribes are Africa or South American forests, maybe some people in Southeast Asia. Because they don't, the people who do the defining, they, they have an idea. The tribe is more primitive in their mind. Don't ever use that word. That's, a, that's, a, that's, that's one of the worst things. No, you, I mean, they used to say European tribes, but they don't say it anymore. And you say the German tribes, oh, no, 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 you know. We, we, we can't say Visigoth tribe anymore like that. They're nations, they're people, they're ethnic groups. We, we have to resignify. That's part of the Afrocentric idea. That's part of why in the United States right now they have a big issue among white people. They call it critical race theory. Black people want to change everything. No, we don't want to change everything. We just want to assert our own narrative of truth. And that's important for you to do that. You don't have to accept any superiority of anybody. And nobody can be superior to you unless you accept inferiority. We need to have sections dealing with forced dispersions, the ma'afa, as Marimba Ani says, from the Islamic and Christian intrusions into Africa. African Indians in India and Indian Africans in South Afri Africa are other examples. The Liberian context is the perfect arena for this pivot to the future. We have learned and we can learn from it transcending issues of ethnicity and race. One can never forget the epic and courageous return to Africa in 1822. And now, in a new moment in history, we will not forget this celebration 200 years later in 2022. It is the history that is the source of a powerful initiative, making use of the collective histories of all peoples of this magnificent country will lend credibility to this path and this Pan-African launch for the Center for Migration and the Diaspora. What is 200 years? It is six generations out of the many thousands since the appearance of humans on this continent. We need to share in all African achievements and not become sectionalized and fragmented by ethnicities, so-called races and re re regions. Europe and Arabia cannot be our teacher in ethics and values. But both areas of the world have organized their academies. We have the Pan-Arabic and the Pan-European academies. China has organized the Confucius Institutes with the idea of promoting cultural traditions. These academies of other people have their own rules, major philosophers, academic leaders, deans of knowledge and mission. Every one of Africa's children who left here long before the enslavement sees the continent as the source of the future. Therefore, we must have our own ideas, even as we weigh the ideas of others. We have learned and we will learn from others, but we must first taste the cooking of our own mothers. For Africans, we must overcome ethnic divisions. In the Ivory Coast, I asked an educator 
who was going to build a school. And I asked him why was he naming the new school after Montesquieu, who I said was a big supporter of slavery. I said, why not name it after Blyden or Sheikh Anta Job? And he asked me, isn't Job a Senegalese? I said, yes. And Montesquieu is French. So why would you rather name your school after French races rather than the greatest African intellectual of the 20th century? Let us be clear. Voltaire, Dante, Edgar Allan Poe, Hemingway, Shakespeare, Goethe are all accepted in the Pan-European Academy, regardless of nationality. Europeans don't say, well, Shakespeare was English, so he's not an important European. Dante was Italian, so he's not important. No, I don't say that. They accept all of them. You got to do the same. Why shouldn't you claim Du Bois and Toni Morrison? Why shouldn't you claim Abdias do Nascimento from Brazil? Why shouldn't you? They, they're all African. This, this, this sectionalism is a dangerous thing. Why aren't there books by African scholars, African diaspora scholars, in universities in Africa. I questioned the dean at the University of Yaoundé about this in Cameroon. I said, you know, you get, you're citing all these European scholars. Where are the black, where are the African-American books? We got scholars. Where are the books by the, by the African people who are writing in French and Haiti? This is a French-speaking country. Well, Haiti is a French-speaking nation, and they have a history of intellectuals. Well, where is it? That has to do with where we think and how we think. Who said that only Europeans could write this or that? To have a center for migration and diaspora studies is powerful, but it must truly teach us how to love ourselves our traditions, our teachers, our philosophers from, from the entire African world. So we share, I share, and I know my own history is global. Our aim must be to study the interactions between humans for patterns and models of good community behavior. In my new book, Being Human Being, Transforming the Race Discourse, written with Nadav, we asserted the idea of human beingness regardless of color, creed, gender, or class, as the key to a truly human future. Africans are global people, and the fact that Iceland's Miss Universe in 2019 was of African heritage is a recent example of dispersion. But an older dispersion happened over the past 500 years due to our encounter with Europe. In 1441, a Portuguese ship took Africans from the Senegal River region to Lisbon to open what would become the European slave trade. I do not call it African slave trade or transatlantic slave trade or trans-Sahara slave trade. The ocean and the desert never did anything to us. That is why I say European slave trade and Arab slave trade, which predated the European dispersion of Africans. Let no one tell you that Africans started the international slave trade. Chattel slavery of others was never in Africa's history until Arabs and Europeans came to the continent. Were there African collaborators? Yes, but there will always be collaborators. You got collaborators today. During apartheid in South Africa, there were black police. But apartheid was not an African initiative. You can't blame it on the black police. In all of my studies of Africa, I have not found where African culture or African people made slavery the principal mode of production. If you got an example, tell me. 
The Center for Migration and Diaspora Studies must be beyond ethnicity, color, religion, language, and its acceptance and analysis of, African, of the African diaspora. Yet to be beyond ethnicity and color does not mean to ignore who you are, your heritage, and your tradition, but to accept the same from and for other people. The center should be fiercely Afrocentric, grounded in classical African texts, articulating a com common narrative of excellence and victory, asserting the liberation of women while understanding a global Africa as a producer of knowledge and dedicated to resisting all forms of domination. We must accept all contribution of those who claim Africa. The great James Weldon Johnson went to the Institute of the Pacific Relations Conference in Kyoto, Japan in 1929 and spoke for us. And I'm not gonna go, I got a whole list, you can read this later, uh, I'll leave the paper. Uh, but there are all kinds of Africans all over the world doing all kinds of things. And some of them you know, some of them we have never heard of. We never d didn't know the names of these people. Uh, but they have done many, many, many things. The, the mother uh, of Afro-Peruvian dance is Victoria Eugenia Santa Cruz. But most people never heard of her. But she's an African woman. The, the, the founder of one of the first the free areas of the Americas was Yanga, a Congolese who lived in Mexico. One of the great warriors of the 1500s and 1600s was Zumbi of Brazil. But we never heard of them, or Nanny of Jamaica, the Akan woman, much like Ya Asantewa who led her fight against the British. Desaline, the greatest general who defeated Napoleon's army led by Leclerc in 1804 in Haiti. Look at this. We have this history. We, we know this, these stories. The first black president in North America was not Barack Obama. The first black president was Vicente Guerrero, 1829. He was the Mexican president who terminated slavery in Mexico. But we don't know our history. In fact, in fact, one of the reasons for the great, and I'm sure the ambassador from the United States knows this, the, the great battle of the Alamo was because the Mexicans believed that the white Americans were going to bring slavery into Texas. And so they sent Santa Ana's army up to San Antonio to prevent the white Americans from bringing Africans from Louisiana and Arkansas into Texas and enslaving them. That's what that fact was about. Why do we know this? Because Santa Ana wrote it in his journal. But this was because Mexico and Texas was a part of Mexico. And Mexico didn't have slavery. But Americans were going to bring it. He said, no, you ain't going to do that here. We can't let you do that. So, but we got to know this. Our challenges are great. But our victories are certain. Liberia will, with its wings setting sail toward a new century, can bring into being an Africa free of hierarchy and patriarchy, the parents of racism, oppression of women, brutality against numerical minorities, and classism. On this continent, the first queens in the world ruled. Sobeknafru, Hatshepsut, Cleopatra, Amenorensis, Amanashakati, 
Idia, and hundreds of others. Nubia still ranks as the ancient culture with more queens than any other nation. Forty-two women serve as queens in Nubia. On this continent, Homo sapiens first called the name of God. On this continent, we established what was edible, what was not. On this continent, we established the names of the days of the week, and we established the calendar. On this continent and in this fertile nation, we will plant the seeds of migration and diaspora studies. So we have challenges, but we have always overcome them. You are not an insular people. You are a global while some of you are descendants of those who spent over 200 years in America from 1619 to 1821, and another 200 years since the Elizabeth landed in 1822, and others of you have spent 50,000 years or more on the Windward Coast, you are one people, democratic, energetic, and noble. Your nobility is unquestioned, and now you must rise again and take the new century by launching this Center for Migration and Diaspora. Thank you. Wow. Spellbound. Extraordinary. Remarkable. That, that's all right. That's all right. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please, let's give Dr. Molifi a war rattling hand of applause for such moving, impactful, intellectual delivery befitting of this your Renaissance conference. I'm thrilled, certainly everybody in this room is thrilled, and I can almost guarantee Dr. Asante, our audience at large, is ecstatic at the, the revelation. I am so pleased. And your speech, your delivery will be subsequently analyzed uh, beyond this conference in our country, on the radio, on the internet. We are live on ELBC radio right now. So people everywhere in this country, in Lofa County, in Maryland County, in the far-flung and inaccessible areas of our country, have listened to you. I hope they will understand, you know, what you said, but you were very clear enough. Very powerful, ladies and gentlemen. This is the essence of this conference, and it is absolutely no mistake that we brought you all the way from Philadelphia. And as chairman of the planning committee, you know, I went through it to ensure that you came on time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Tillon. So good, good, you know, I, I, you, you're right, we have to clean all, everything, you know, collectively. I mean, I was a student here in post-war Liberia at the University of Liberia, and unfortunately, I didn't read W.E. Du Bois, The Source of Black Folks. I didn't read Zara New Houston. I didn't read Richard Son, uh, Nathan Son by Richard Wright, until I went to the United States. And I was amazed, you know, when I read Tony Morris in The Beloved. So you are right, this center has to ensure that these books are in there so that our students can, can read them. Thank you very much. We'll talk more about your speech, your delivery subsequently. Let me also announce the arrival of uh, some of our guests, why Dr. Molofi was delivering his very impassioned and highly intellectually driven speech. Our senior, our senator, Senator Cominet B. Wise, uh from River G. County, 
uh, is here. Uh, we didn't send him an official invitation, but he was going to section today, uh, and you heard it on the radio. Uh, it's important as he considered this University of Liberia, he turned around and came to this conference. So, Senator, please. Uh, we're, glad, we're glad to have you, and he's a, he's a true Pan-Africanist. Uh, you know, he was student in 1978. He became the president of the University of Liberia Student Union. Uh, and his ascendancy to the student leadership coincided with the first female presidency of Dr. Mary Anthony Brown Sherman. So, you know, he provided his, 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 his leadership provided that bare rock as well. So, Senator, we're, we're glad to, to have you here. We also have uh, the chairman of the U.S. Board of Trustees, Honorable Representative, Representative Matthew Zaza. Uh, he is here. And ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to invite him to sort of respond to the, the delivery. And, and, and I'd like you to, before you to come up, Dr. Molofi, Dr. Please, please come up back here because this center has to be officially launched. Uh, it has to be officially launched. So uh, you, in effect, launch it by your delivery, but you know, we have to go through the ceremony and then Dr. Uh, Representative Matthew, you will, you will sort of respond. So we'll call the uh, camera so that we can do this. I hereby launch the Center for Migration and Diaspora Studies. <laughs> My fellow members of the Board of Trustees of the University of Liberia, the President and uh, Faculty of the University of Liberia, the guest people, our invited guests, I didn't come here to preach another sermon. The speech that, that was delivered covered everything. That, that I said, thank you very much. Uh, what is left with the Board now is to work with the faculty, the administration, so that uh, this center will be actualized. Um, we will not soil your good speech. As I said, we are not going to deliver a speech. I have written nothing. That, I am a student of your student, Sir Abdullah Vani. He taught me African history. So when he talked about him, I knew that you were a teacher. You were his instructor. Thank you very much. Um, here. Originally, Africa was looked at as dark continent. Nobody knew what was going on here. So they wrote and said, a dark continent. Is this continent a dark continent? No, it's not. That was act of ignorance. Even when black men was taken to America, uh, from what we read, they say he was not full human being. He was half human being. Is black man half human being? This is act of, out of ignorance. It is said that education has no end. The center that we've learned today is in the rightful place. Why? Liberia has been the center for the African liberation movement. Therefore, the University of Liberia is the rightful center to establish diaspora and migration movement. <clears throat> Dr. Nelson, I challenge you and the faculty members, the board challenges you and the faculty members to actualize this brilliant idea to continue our role in African liberation. Yes, so many things have been said, but we must understand our history. Even 
In this country, when our brothers and sisters returned, our home brothers and sisters said we were not uh, citizens until in the 30s. I mean, this is uh, no, uh, it's out of ignorance. Education is a continuous process. Dr. Ashanti, our visiting professors, I say thank you. The members of the faculty, Mr. President of the university, I say thank you, and we'll work with you to ensure that this vision is actualized. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Honorable Representative Matthew Zaza of Synod County, who is also the chair of the UL Board of Trustees. Thank you very much. One of the legacies of this international conference is certainly the establishment of the Center for Migration and Diaspora Studies. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, uh, we are proceeding quite well. We had a small challenge at the beginning. Nobody's going to remember that challenge now that we have heard um, the guest speaker and other speakers before. At this stage, ladies and gentlemen, we'll now uh, take remarks. Uh, we have here several institutions and individuals who we've invited to perform uh, greetings or remarks. Uh, so we're going to we're going to make a segue now to our first uh, the first person who will make uh, bring his his greetings, and and that will be Mr. John L. Archibald, who is the president of the Trustees of the Nation for Education in Liberia, TDL. After Trustees Archibald's remarks, we will pause the remarks and take a special selection from the UL chorus. Uh, so to simmer things down a little bit and then we'll come back to remarks and then you know eventually uh, adjoin this morning this morning section which is now uh, into the afternoon. Uh, so, Trustee Archibald, are you ready? We are all here looking at you. You're smiling. You're ready to go. So, please, let's give uh, Trustee Archibald a hand of applause so that he knows that we're ready to take him. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Wonderful. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, I'm speaking to you from Boston, Massachusetts. You do not want to be here. It's minus 10 degrees centigrade certainly don't need air conditioning here. I'm the president of the Trustees for Donations for Education in Liberia, a nonprofit foundation that's been supporting higher education in Liberia since 1850. Very impressed with the scope and the range of this international conference and we're very honored to be invited. Our foundation has been supporting this university since it was founded as Liberia College in 1862, we raised the funds to construct the very first building, recruit the staff and the professors, provided the college with necessary books and teaching materials. And well, the college has grown and now has become the University of Liberia. And we have continued our support. One example is the Union Graduate Computer Lab at Fendel. Our primary focus has always been the library. It has a constant need for books, computers, staff training, uh, and other things. But we also fund student scholarships and other projects. This year, for example, we've given $53,000 US dollars for the library and scholarships, and an additional 120,000 US dollars in unrestricted funds for the university to use as it decides best. We're always looking for opportunities to assist the university as it continues to grow and to add new programs. I'm here to listen and to learn, not to lecture. 
My fellow trustee, Charles Newell, is also here, and he will be participating tomorrow in the discussion, University of Liberia, The Road Ahead. Some of our other trustees may be following this conference by Zoom. We're looking forward to an interesting, fruitful, and even exciting conference. Thank you again for inviting us. Thank you very much, Trustee. Uh, we look forward to having you here next year when we celebrate the Founders' Day, uh, you and uh, members of your, your trustees. Uh, we certainly appreciate the tremendous contribution that the trustees of Donations for Education in Liberia continues to make well, on behalf of the University of Liberia. Also following us live uh, are several people, but one such individual is former President Dr. Al Hassan Conte, uh, who is Liberia's ambassador to the Federal Republic of Nigeria. It is my understanding that early this morning he was the first to log in at 9 o'clock, and uh, we came under pressure to start this conference. So give the former president of the University of Liberia a big hand of applause. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to shift gear a little bit and in fact, for special redemption, the U.S. Chorus, under the esteemed directorship of Anthony at Law, Prince A. Decker. Please give the U.S. Chorus a hand of applause as they proceed down here and They are in their official regalia, the colors of the University of Liberia, red, white, and blue. And they have been practicing some songs that we have not heard before. And just, I'm, I'm sure they're, they're going to be a, the song version of Dr. Molefi's speech. Good morning or good afternoon. Contemporaneous upon the event of today, which is the Founders' Day, the University of Liberia will sing the birthday song of the University of Liberia, which is the University of Liberia Road first, and then we'll do a national song, and then another song in Kru, the Klao dialect, Kabena Dana Susunate.
you may have your seats, please.
Let's, let's please give them a big hand again. The UL Chorus, in their full representation, in their full renaissance. So we are branding the University of Liberia. So we are UL, UL. People who went to this school in the 60s, in the 70s, and some in the 80s, tend to call this university LU, right? And some people still do. But we are UL. This is who we are, UL. So this conference should, you know, clearly reiterate who we are, UL Renaissance. And thank you, UL Chorus, for such a splendid performance as always. If you want more of the UL Chorus, please would like to invite you next week at our commencement convocation, 102 commencement convocation, and the UL Chorus is often on remarkable display during the entire week of convocation. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are fast approaching lunchtime, and we will soon go to lunch. However, we still have some important uh, uh, activities to, to, to conclude this section. After lunch, we will make a segue into our panel discussion, and you know, everybody in this hall is anxiously waiting for that panel discussion. But I'd like to uh, announce that because of a pressing engagement, uh, the uh, special envoy of the President of the Republic of South Africa who is also ambassador of South Africa to Guinea-Bissau, has to leave. So we'll, we'll 
ask uh, Dr. Judith Tontillo to please escort the uh, ambassador uh, outside as we um, proceed with the rest of the program. Ambassador, thank you very much for coming. Uh, please come again. You know, and you are here, but we, we, we relish your presence this, this morning and now. Thank you. Please give the ambassador a hand of applause as he leaves. Thank you very much. Okay. So I have the master copy. And so we will, we will now tweak a little bit. Instead of calling Professor Fuli Saar, we will have Professor Saar come the last. Yes. We have Professor Saar come the last. Uh, he's our brother. The president of the University of Liberia opened this conference. We want the president of the University of Sierra Leone to close the morning section. So at this stage, it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Afi Odegami uh, from Princeton Theological Seminary to bring us greetings from Princeton Theological Seminary at this international conference. Good afternoon, President Nelson. Thank you for inviting me. And I'm standing here to bring greetings from uh, my president, Professor Craig Barnes, Princeton Theological Seminary. Uh, I know the day is already uh, fast spent, and uh, having listened to uh, Dr. Asante, I do not want to give uh, another speech, but I'm in trouble now because the president of my seminary has prepared long remarks. Please don't tell him I didn't read everything. <laughs> so let me try to abridge uh, a longer version of his uh, uh, presentation here, and I would like to make, give a copy to uh, President Nelson. I send my best greetings to University President Julius Nelson, Jr. and the participants of this international conference. I deeply regret that my travels prevent me from joining you for this important event. But I express my appreciation to Dr. Afe Adogame, our seminary's Obsin Professor of Religion and Society, for reading my speech to you. I've been asked to depict some of the events over the last five years at Princeton Theological Seminary, which relate to the founding of Liberia 200 years ago, and which also have profoundly impacted our seminary. As the president of our seminary in the spring of 2016, I commissioned a committee of professors and administrators to engage in a deep examination of our school's historical connections to the enslavement of people of African descent. This committee studied the relationship of the seminary's founders to slavery, the activities and writings of our professors and alumni as they pertain to slavery, the economic base of our facilities that were constructed prior to the Civil War, and the participation of our early professors and board members in the American Colonization Society. After two years of careful research, the scholarly committee published its report. This work uncovers the contradictions and complexities of the claims and practices of the seminary's early faculty, students, and donors. Without any effort to vanish or protect the seminary's uh, reputation, it clearly depicts both profound moral failings and courageous acts of faithfulness to the gospel. 
Among the important revelations of this report are the following, and I will just uh, uh, cite a few. One, when Princeton Seminary was founded in 1812, both the national culture and local community were deeply entangled economically, politically, and socially with slavery. By this time, the slave economy, though rooted in the southern states, had made its way into every aspect of life in the United States. While none uh, of our seminaries' buildings were constructed by slaves, and we never housed slaves on campus, there was no such thing as clean money. So while only 15% of the seminary's early endowment contributions came from slave owners, all of our funding came from people who somehow benefited from slavery. For example, a donor who owned a railroad may have lived in New York, but much of his wealth came from transporting cotton. Even to buy or sell a cotton shirt in Boston made one complicit with an economy driven on the back of slaves. Two, the seminary's founders had a complicated relationship to slavery, like many of their generation in the northern states. The first three professors of the seminary, Archibald Alexander, Samuel Miller, and Charles Hodge, all used slave labor at some point in their lives. Princeton Seminary faculty, board members, and alumni were deeply involved in the American Colonization Society, which advocated sending former slaves to Africa. Though many of his members opposed slavery in principle, they feared immediate emancipation would cause social upheaval. The society was founded in 1816 by, among others, Robert Finley, a pastor and board member of the seminary. In 1824, a local auxiliary was founded in Princeton for which Professor Charles Hodge served as a manager and Professors Archibald Alexander and Samuel Miller were honorary managers. The writings of Alexander and Hodge in support of the colonization movement point to the widely shared assumption of the society's leaders that blacks and whites could not live peacefully and productively in the same society. It was a profound failure of theological imagination by 1867, the society had sent more than 13,000 people to Liberia. While today we rejoice with you in the founding of the country of Liberia, our history reveals that what we meant for evil, God used for good. So this research uh, contains many more details I don't have time to go into here, which provides a critical reckoning with our complicated past with slavery. Significantly, our goal in launching this research was not only to confess the tr uh, truth about what did happen, but also to uncover the roots of what uh, does happen. Thus, the true motivation for slavery audit that was conducted at Princeton Theological Seminary was to discuss the ongoing legacy in racism in our seminary. This reckoning with our past means that every member of the seminary community has to own this legacy as our history and seek its redemption through a more just and equitable way of uh, living together. There are well over 100 schools of higher uh, education in the United States engaged in this research about our institutions, which is part of a national re reckoning with how deeply grounded they are in the slave economy of the 18th and 19th centuries. They have created a new consortium called Universities Studies Studying Slavery, 
which our seminary has joined. So, at his board meeting in October 2019, the seminary's trustees unanimously adopted a multi-year plan to repent for the school's relationship to slavery and to commit to tangible action to shape the future of our community of faith and scholarship in meaningful ways. Together, these responses account for over a million dollars a year in expenditures from our annual operating budget. The seminary knows we can never fully pay the debt we owe to the descendants of slaves, but we can make acts of repair, which seek to redress historical wrongs and redeem our legacy of racism as we strive to be a more faithful witness to the reign of God. Among our acts of repentance are the following. Again, I will just uh, mention two or three. One, honoring the legacy of the African-American experience in the Princeton Seminary through the names of prominent campus spaces, which has included A, naming the new library after Theodore Sedgwick Wright, B, naming of the Bessin Stocking uh, Center for Black Church Studies, C, disassociating, disassociating the name of Samuel Miller from the seminary chapel, D, establishing a board task force to develop theological principles and practice uh, processes as guidelines for reviewing the names of all sites and honors on campus. E, developing a permanent historical exhibit in the Wright Library to interpret the seminary's history uh, with slavery. Two, offering new scholarships for students uh, are descend who are descendants of slaves or from other historically disenfranchised community to ensure that a seminary education is affordable and does not further contribute to the disproportionate debt uh, burden of students from these communities. So, for instance, uh, at any time, this means the seminary is maintaining a total of A, 30 Francis Grimke Scholarship for master's degree students, which includes full tuition plus $15,000 per year in living expenses. B, five Peter Parrish scholarships for, five, for PhD students, which includes full tuition plus $35,000 per year in living expenses. Advanced scholarship and promote learning about the legacy of slavery in America and African American perspectives on faith. One of the commitment is to hire an accomplished professor of African American Christianity whose research will give critical attention to the legacy of slavery in the African experience and ecclesial life. B, continue to recruit faculty of color in all departments. C, fully fund the Bethsin Stocking Church a Center for Black Church Studies, including hiring a full-time director. D, highlight the seminary lecture, lectureships that focus on the African-American experience, including the Jades Hansen Lecture, the Martin Luther King Jr. Lecture, and the Patria uh, Hall Lecture. Finally, contribute to conversations in the broader academy, church, society, and world about the legacy of slavery. So these are some of what we've uh, attempted to do. A, join the University Studying Slavery Consortium of other institutions of higher education that are conducting this research and ongoing work. B, create offerings through the Department of Continuing Education that explore the legacy of slavery in America and make the findings of the historical audit available to the broader church and academy. C, develop relationships with African-American congregations and historically black colleges and, and universities like Howard and Lincoln universities. D, through the seminary's uh, family project, 
develop learning opportunities to pursue the restoration of the broken relationship between the church and the land caused by slavery and its legacy. E, in partnership with the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture and Howard University, co-sponsor a conference in Washington, D.C. on slavery and its manifold afterlives. F, in partnership with the University of Liberia, co-sponsor a conference in Liberia on the topic of the legacy of the American colonization society. And quite spontaneously, while we're thinking about uh, this centenary, uh, what we should do, uh, we have uh, decided to propose to the president of the University of Liberia that instead of having the uh, Washington DC, DC conference in October and then have the Liberian conference next year, we thought that it's quite important to flow with the centenary events. And here we would like to propose to the University of Liberia uh, if it is possible that we jointly host another conference in October here. So to conclude, the Board of Trustees uh, also established a timeline for the completion of this promise, promises to the uh, slavery audit, all of which should be completed by the fall of 2024. And it created an implementation committee that must report at least annually to the board regarding the seminary's progress. COVID-19 has uh, delayed our ability to sponsor the conferences, but we hope that with the conference with uh, you this year, uh, it will uh, be a good starting point. So uh, our de devotion is to continue to listen, learn, reform, and collaborate with other schools and churches, both in our country and around the world, in serving the peace-filled, just reign of Christ on earth. And we certainly look forward to future opportunities to work with the churches and schools of Liberia. May God bless this conference and the people of Liberia as you celebrate the bicentennial of your nation's founding and may your future witness more of the unfolding of God's blessing on your people. Thank you. So let the people of God say. Thank you very much. Professor. Okay, so um, we are almost there. I'd like to, just before I call uh, Professor Sa, uh, the University of Liberia has had 14 past presidents, including the current president, Dr. Julius Nelson. And, and so it's fitting, since we're celebrating the uh, founding of the university, we have one past president uh, and uh, certainly uh, bring us a special remark. So it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Ahasan Conte, who will bring us uh, brief remarks on behalf of past presidents of the University of Liberia. He was the 11th president of the University of Liberia. Professor Dr. Conte, please, we are listening. Thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of the, uh, all the former presidents of the University of Liberia, let me extend greeting to President Nelson and the U.S. Senate for blazing the trail in organizing this uh, Founders Day uh, International. Like you. And felicity of the 
former presidents to our distinguished guests, including Professor Molife Asante uh, for his uh, distinguished lecture, uh, and uh, including John Achibal of the Trustees of Donations for Education in Liberia. Finally, I hope that uh, all of the messages that have been delivered today uh, and tomorrow will help to uh, build a greater foundation of the University of Liberia and by extension, our dear Republic of Liberia, that we call Mama Liberia. Thank you very much, and I wish you a productive conference. Well said. Thank you, Dr. Conte. We love you here. You are a great partner to the University of Liberia, always. At this stage, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure and singular honor to invite for special remarks Professor Fode Sa, Vice Chancellor, University of Sierra Leone. Please rise. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, Mr. Moderator, I beg to stand on existing protocols. Good afternoon, all. I want to start by thanking the administration of the University of, Sia of uh, Liberia, um, especially Professor Nelson, for extending an invitation to the University of Sierra Leone to join them in this memorable occasion. This visit coincides with the return-led visit of the University of Sierra Leone to the University of Liberia as a result of a visit made by the President of the University of Liberia and his team to Sierra Leone. During that visit, it was interesting when we were summoned to State House by His Excellency the President. Brigadier retired Julius Mada Bio, that we should report immediately for the signing of an MOU with the University of Liberia. That was the first of its kind. <laughs> Never in the history of any higher learning institution in Sierra Leone has an MOU been signed at State House. So that was a special one. We, we are given special directives by our president, that is, the University of Sierra Leone and the University of Liberia, that he wants us to translate the speeches into action. And immediately after that signing, we started work, the two administrations behind the scene, to make sure that we actualize all that was contained in the MOU. That is why today we are here, a high power delegation. We came with all those that are responsible for decision making in the University of Sierra Leone to make sure that we complete all the elements in the MOU. There is no say that, okay, let's draft something when we go back to Freetown, then before we start implementing, no. Everything is going to be completed here. We, me, we have the Deputy Vice Chancellor of the Frabi College, which is the oldest institution. Professor um, Joseph Kamara is here. The Deputy Vice Chancellor of the College of Medicine and Allied Health Sciences also is here, Professor Samai. The Deputy Vice Chancellor of the Institute of Public Administration and Management, Professor Noni, is here. And we have the uh, dean of Postgraduate Studies in the University of Sierra Leone, Professor J.D. Ali, is also here. We have the Registrar of the University, Mrs. Uh, Olive Barry, and the Finance Director, Walter Amake, is here. And the University Liberian, Professor Conte Morgan, Mrs. Marion Conte Morgan, Associate Professor, is always also here. And we have deans of faculties and the director of quality assurance and strategic planning 
also came with us to make sure that we cement whatever we are going to start before we leave here. So on behalf of the University of Sierra Leone, I want to say um, thank you to the University of Liberia, and I wish you fruitful celebrations. Thank you very much. Good, a hand of applause for the distinguished Vice Chancellor. If the University of Sierra Leone was in Liberia, we'd be calling you President. But Vice Chancellor, I understand, is the equivalent of President. Good. Thank you very much for coming with such a high power 27 uh, person delegation to, our, to Liberia. And I'm very confident that you are enjoying your stay. You're welcome to even stay more. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have come to the end of the, the morning section. Um, I think we have exhausted. Let me make sure that uh, we, yes, we have exhausted all of the items uh, on the morning section, and we are going to segue into lunch. Uh, and so at this stage, my, my tax has the MC for this section uh, for today is over. And I'd like to invite uh, uh, Ms. Jenny Jala Colley, who is the Director of Your Relations, to come and take over. She will be the MC for the afternoon section, as well as she will provide housekeeping relative to the sumptuous lunch that is awaiting all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Chair of the Planning Committee, for such a great MC during the first section. Thank you very much. I mean, we can see the work is still going on, so thank you. I know you will rest after tomorrow. Thank you very much. Um, for housekeeping, the first six roles in the front, please, there are protocol officers in black and white. They will direct you to your lunch room. The second road in the back, after the first six rows that carry the deans and academic directors, you will join the first five and six rows to go to your lunchroom, which is on my right. Uh, rest of the, our very important delegates will proceed downstairs uh, for 